I think we need to take a broad evaluation of the impact that we have as humans, and that includes how hunters impact their environment around it and how they both on a positive and a negative level, potentially a negative level. Welcome. I am your host, Byron Pace, and this is the Into the Wilderness podcast, a modern huntsman production. This is episode 212, and you're going to be hearing from our good friend, Danny Christensen, all the way from Italy. Uh, he's been on the show before, I think just once, but a couple of years ago, but he has just launched a new TV series on Wild TV, and you're about to hear all about it. Uh, if you want to look at what he's talking about as he's talking about it, I would just head over to his website, The Urban Huntsman, or his YouTube channel, The Urban Huntsman, and you will be able to watch trailers of the film series that we discuss in this episode. In fact, I just looked at his Instagram account, and there's a couple of uh, teasers and trailers on his Instagram account as well, which is The Urban Huntsman. Danny is a photographer, a writer, a philosopher, a conservationist, a farmer, a chef. He is a man who wears many hats, and this is another brilliant conversation with him. I always take away uh, something different about the way I view life after I speak with Danny, whether that be over a beer at a bar or in a more in-depth conversation like we have here. Before we get to that, for those of you who haven't picked up a copy of Modern Huntsman Volume 9 yet, they are in the shop and shipping. So head to modernhuntsman.com. You can read a spiel about the kind of stories that are in Volume 9. In fact, if you go back to the episode that I released two weeks ago, you will hear from Rob Green, and he talks all about one of the stories that is in Volume 9 about the grizzly bear issue and conflict in North America. One of many amazing stories in Volume 9. So head over to the shop, modernhuntsman.com, and get your order there. Or better still, subscribe, and you will get the two books that we publish every year to your doorstep without thinking about it and without missing it. In news and new releases, if you head over to either my Instagram account uh, at Byron J. Pace or the Modern Huntsman Instagram account, Modern Huntsman, uh, you will see the first teaser of a short doc that we are releasing at the end of this month all about the wildlife artist, John Banovich. So go over and check that now and then keep your eyes out for the end of the month where we will be releasing and premiering the film on Vimeo. There will be another podcast out before that. So I will remind you all once again and uh, I will even stick the link for the film in the show notes of the next episode. But before you hear from Danny, of course, I need to give a shout out to the top tier patrons for this month who help make this show possible. Uh, and they include Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of RD Contracting, James Marchington, the guys at South Ash are stalking, Thomas Cameron, Mark Zabrowski, and Colin Knight. Thank you, everyone, for supporting the show, not just the top tier patrons, but all of the other uh, lower tier patrons. Literally every dollar makes it possible to for me to put this show out every two weeks. Um, and if you would like to support the show, head over to patreon.com forward slash Byron Pace. Danny, welcome back to the Interval of the You have been on before, haven't you? I you have. have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was no, yeah, it's some time ago, though. Yeah, it was a while ago, a couple of years ago, I think, no? Yeah, yeah, no, I think so. Um, we're, you're back on the show today. Uh, I'm, not, we're, I'm sure that our conversation is going to end up in a, a million different directions, but primarily to talk about a new show that you've, it's either just aired or it's, it's just about to air, uh, where you traveled to some interesting places and met fascinating people and filmed hunting and cooking and all of the good stuff that you do all of the time. How did that come about? <laughs> Um, well, my, my, my side projects, as, as you know, I'm a, a commercial photographer and director and, um, I started the project when I lived in New York city and, um, and it's a project I called the urban huntman. And it was basically just for my, for my own, uh, personal experiences to get out of the city and, and join, um, uh, rejoin with nature again and get out and go do some hunting and fishing etc um so this project has been ongoing for the last eight years i've uh, written a lot of articles for food magazines and also some for hunting magazines and uh, for our friends at uh, modern huntsman uh, amongst others 
Um, and while TV reached out to me a year and a half ago now and asked if I would be interested in, in uh, entertaining an idea of taking that concept of the Urban Huntsman to TV and, and produce a 13-episode uh, uh, season. Uh, yeah, so that's a, it was kind of a, an invite from, from Wild to be uh, thinking that the, uh, the concept itself was was interesting the subjects that I that I normally touch on was pretty interesting and it was off the time so to speak so um, yeah so that's it then we uh, put everything together and 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 kind of had it rolling within a couple of months which was a very short pre-production t- period to get everything kind of going and um, ready to to film so so they had seen what is it that they had seen was it your instagram account or other work or articles yeah they've seen somewhere? the instagram account i think um obviously been on on the website and seen some of of the content the re- more of the written content there i i typically um the format of the urban huntsman is that i'll i'll pick some sort of a activity associated with the outdoors um and with a strong component or link over to food uh, it could typically be a, a hunt or a fishing trip for something specific, and then uh, then kind of uh, taking it, rolling, uh, let, letting it roll from there, and, and see what actually happens. Do we catch anything? Don't we catch anything? What is there around? So I typically forage something. Sometimes we cook out in the wild. Other times in the kitchen in more controlled environments. Um, and I guess that uh, the, the format kind of worked well for Wild TV, and it's obviously something that's been uh, getting a lot of attention over the last three, four years now. I started the project like eight years ago, and um, and have have then developed a lot of these projects with with food and the outdoors, um, and written a story to each one of these. Um, each each one of these adventures. Um, sometimes the the focus is on the food. Sometimes it's more on the hunting. Uh, sometimes it's more about the personal experience. Um, that's quite often a lot of humor in over it because, hmm. yeah, as you know, I know from your stories. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I don't know. My my brain definitely runs wild and comes up with all kinds of weird ways of entertaining itself when you're sitting out there for hours and not seeing <laughs> it. So, uh, so, so some of those crazy thoughts are I'm, I'm trying to get down on paper and remember them and, and try to, to recite them in a, in a way that's uh, engaging and also understandable to a certain degree, at least for the, for the readers. Because uh, I'm, my guess is about 50% of what's going on in my head is probably in, incomprehensible for anybody else but me (laughs) so i guess this is this question is going to run over into the actual film component and i want to speak to you about the different episodes but who who is this for like who is your audience who is reading the content that you create and looking at the images that you take around the urban huntsman um well, it's it's a bit of a, a deep dive question. Um, I have some analytics, of course, that I'm now paying a lot more attention to than I ever done before, uh, because as you, as you know, when we start talking about social media, we have um, we have a need of understanding the algorithms and actually what they're triggering and and how these the content that we produce is actually getting recognized and, and being consumed. Um, so I look a lot more at the analytics, um, but traditionally, I think my, my voice is one of part, uh, part hillbilly redneck and part <laughs> uh, city intellectual. And I think... I think there's something in having a kind of an unfiltered voice, speaking to people on all different levels, speaking to something that's inherently human uh, on a very kind of primal a primal um, uh, level, but at the same time with a contemplation and sophistication that allows people to dig a little deeper and, and for them to contemplate the content that I'm producing. 
So I, I try to produce content that has several different layers. Um, and I think that's why it has an appeal to a quite broad audience. Um, I, don't, I don't think the Generation Z necessarily understands the majority of my voice or my humor, for example. But I think uh, from the millennials and up, there is a free speaking voice that doesn't wrap things in too much and is not afraid of, of kind of taking the microphone and, and saying whatever comes to mind. I don't really wrap things up. I don't, I don't personally have any filters for good, for, for good and bad. And uh, obviously I have to, I have to filter myself quite a lot when I write. So the first, <laughs> uh, the first draft is, is uh, severely butchered. Uh, and after, you know, that the final outcome is a lot more uh, clean and uh, PG than the first version for sure. Um, See, this is why I like drinking with you. <laughs> yeah a couple a couple of glasses in uh, things gets interesting right <laughs> see that's the podcast we need to record <laughs> um so i, I, I think that the i think the appeal is, is broad and um i think i'm able to i know that i'm able to speak to a lot of people uh, in the cities that are not necessarily connected to nature that that is not necessarily uh, primed for any kind of interactions with nature or hunting or fishing for that, or foraging for that sake. But I speak to some, some very basic human needs when I talk, and I'm speaking about the emotional side of it, about the uh, spiritual connection that comes from spending time in, na in nature and also what it does to us um, and mentally. I'm not afraid of talking about those subjects. And I think that's why it has a, a broad appeal, both to people, intellectuals in the cities, uh, kind of wanting, uh, giving them a, 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 uh, an incentive to go out or a drive to go out and try some of these things themselves, or at least live vicariously through some of the stories that I, that I write and that I present to them. At the same time, some of the, the hillbillies, uh, and the rednecks uh, from the boons understand what I'm saying because I'm also <laughs> talking about very primal uh, uh, thoughts and needs and, and emotions that, uh, without speaking too much of emotions and scaring them away. They can <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I think I've, I, I struck that chord right in the middle where I have one foot in, in both worlds, and that goes back to the essence of the project itself, basically the urban huntsman living in an urban environment, being engaged in an urban environment, but at the same time, keeping one foot out in wilderness and having that reconnection. Yeah, I, part. this period of time now where we're living in these very crazy post-COVID uncertain times with you know, Russia rolled over the border into Ukraine and yeah. food shortages and fuel prices going up. I don't think I've ever been so aware and grateful for my ability to sort of exist in the landscape around me. Yeah. I like I was hunting with a friend two days ago and we shot a roebuck, which was awesome. She had, she was over from the States. So um, it's actually Jess. She's been on this podcast a whole bunch of times. She was visiting a mutual friend of ours. Yeah, yeah. And um, we shot this great roebuck. It was a beautiful evening. And that roebuck, she took some home to go and uh, eat. Well, not home, but where she was staying. And um, the rest of it's in my freezer, which joins the other roe deer that is in my freezer along with the other meat. And I'm kind of planning now the start of the seasons come September to fill up the other freezer, which is currently empty with with pheasant. And that's kind of how my brain works. Yeah. And I know that there's produce coming out of my dad's garden right now. And I'm thinking about the the cycles of the year because mm -hmm. that's how I exist on this planet. Yeah. And it removes a lot of the reliability on the outside world. And I've never been more grateful for that than now because there is this very, we're living in this very scary time where we literally don't know what bombshell is about to drop tomorrow. And I would imagine that this, this kind of uh, mindset and world that you've tapped into crossing this boundary 
is going to be ever more appealing to people as they try and understand how they can keep control of their lives in a world where there seems to be no control on anything. Yeah, I, I think at least well, I, I hope at least I can um, I can be a, a one source of of inspiration if if nothing else. Um, I'm hoping that I can show that it's actually possible that you can live in an urban environment and figure out a way that you can uh, either have a little garden at home or you can go out and, and participate in, in harvesting some of your, your own food, your protein sources in the wild, either through fishing or uh, hunting. Um, and I, I'm fully aware that in... Uh, today's world with uh, 7 billion plus people, not everybody can do this, but at least hopefully I can help somebody take that step and figure out and, and get some inspiration to to how to actually do that. And, and knowing that that you can live in an urban environment and and there's not many places, maybe except Mexico City, that, that, that within a half an hour you can be out in, in nature. Yeah. You know, so the step is is much smaller, uh, much shorter than many people actually think. And I think um, for, for me specifically, when I lived in New York City and and was immersed into the the fashion and beauty luxury industry there and working in that, it was a very uh, it was a very far idea uh, that was uh, nowhere within seemable reach. Um, but that was simply just because there was no information sources, there was no how-tos, there was no organizations that were encouraging people to do the same or take small steps or plant a little garden on the rooftop or something like that. So that came after, and, and luckily we are going in that direction. I think the self-sustainability is something that is top of mind for so many people, but um I don't know. They're they're uh, kind of like a lice between two uh, <laughs> two nails because they you know they live and work in urban environments and and um, just the physical challenge of making that work somehow is just seems impossible. Yeah, I mean, we were just talking offline before we we hit record about other other ways of making your life sustainable and how much you are reliant on the services that are provided for you. And you were yeah. saying that you've put solar panels on your house. And I actually, in three weeks time, um, I have a whole solar panel and battery system being fitted to my house, even though mm -hmm. I live here in Scotland where <laughs> it is, uh, yeah, the sun does not shine every day. <laughs> but, you know, even with, with modern technology now, um, and when, where I'm using my own power rather than feeding it into the grid mm -hmm. because of the 10 kilowatt battery system, for nine months of the year, I shouldn't really be using any grid power. Uh, no. And that's based on other houses that you know have done it in similar areas. So there I, are lots of ways that you can do it. I mean, you'd think no. energy, is, uh, energy is one of the things that is probably at the forefront of everybody's mind right now because of the prices have gone just completely insane in the last six months. Yeah, of, of course. I mean, I, I was just hanging out with my, my childhood friend yesterday who actually, him and I were... Uh, the two bad apples in the town that we grew up in, and we were, uh, we were, of course, the ones that were that were shooting guns way before we were allowed to, and driving cars uh, years before we were allowed. Far to. too fast, probably. All, all that, yes, all of that, all of the above. Um, but what he was telling me, he lives here in Denmark, and he has a, you know, he has a good job, but now his available amount every month has been cut in half. Wow, uh, over the last two years, so. Obviously, it has a huge impact on people with the energy crisis and, and the inflation of, of the prices going up as much as they have. And it, it's time for some rethinking, but I understand that there's a lot of people that don't really have that ability. Um, as you know, I moved to Italy th three years ago, planning on, on literally you know, being 80 to 90% self-sustainable. Um, it haven't worked out too well yet, but my freezer is at least filled with meat. So that part, I mean, I think I, I might buy twenty percent of my my meat from organic local producers around me, but the rest of it is wild game. Um, the the garden was very ambitious. I 
I, when I still lived in uh, in Woodstock in New York, I had uh, found this book that's called Self Self Sustainable on a Quarter Acre, and uh, I figured that that that's gonna work well in Italy. So I did a, a very big garden project and put um, put uh, eight big raised beds, and then I have two big plots also to to plant in and. Uh, this is the, the third year that I have failed miserably in, in an order this year because of, um, of water crisis, we have no water. You mean it just hasn't uh, rained? No, it's a, it's a wow. drought in, in Northern Italy. The climate change has now, uh, resulted in a drought that's lasted since, uh, basically since June last year. So oh my over, goodness. over a year now we had drought, and and my house is normally spring fed. Yeah. Um, and since July last year, the spring had been dry. We had no no spring fed water. We have um, we have uh, the regular uh, public water also, obviously. So that saved us, but the garden itself has no water access. Jeez. So no garden this year. Last year, um, yeah, last year didn't work out too well either. Also for the water reasons, came come when uh, July came around, we had no more water and everything just died off. So we harvested what we could at that time, and then everything else died off after that. Wow, it's so hard to mitigate for these kind of things when that when it's that is not the norm and hasn't been the norm for decades. Yeah, yeah. My um, the house that I bought, the old man that. Solus, the house is 88 and he said that it's never in his lifetime has the spring run dry run dry so there's some dramatic changes coming and i think it's it's something that i touched on in, in a couple of articles previously one of them for modern huntsman actually about the um the european ibex um because there is a reintroduction program in the southern part of of italy and um and uh, they also reintroduced the chamois the, uh, into that part. But the chamois eats this specific grass type that's the last five, six years and not been able to grow there because of lack of rain and increased temperature. So now that reintroduction project is just, um, it, it's basically, it failed. Um, they died off. So there's a dramatic change is coming and um and it's really hard to understand to what extent we are able to mitigate any of it. Uh, but, but I think as, as hunters, we need to pay attention to that and we need to join in and, and support uh, the climate improvement initiatives all over the world. And now, of course, with, uh, with Putin coming in and dropping bums left and right, it doesn't really help the whole situation. But you could hope that there will be a push for more green energy again and for new solutions uh, but in the in the, at least in the short term it's it's actually had the opposite effect with coal power coal power plants uh, cranking up yeah. back up again uh, yeah. for years of being shot down for environmental concerns so so yeah. are you gonna are you can you sink boreholes on your farm uh yeah 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 that should it should be possible but we don't um there's a lot of people that have tried that a little bit further down in the valley so i sit up on a kind of like a, a little bit up on a hill mountainside and i don't know how um the groundwater levels are in that specific area um but it's something that we would definitely consider i would consider when we when we get to next year, and if uh, if we haven't gotten enough rain, and and the spring has been uh, kind of restarted again, then I got to figure out a, a solution because the public water is also, although it's drinkable, it tastes like. It's, <laughs> so, uh, well, that's not good. Really, no, no. So turning our attention back to your film series, how thirteen? You said thirteen episodes, didn't you? Mm -hmm. 13 episodes is a colossal amount of work i know <laughs> you being someone who makes film yes sir. How, where did you even where did you even start trying to plan what the i mean I'm, i want to talk about how on earth you like went about actually capturing all this stuff but to begin with you got to decide well what are the stories how did you narrow it down to uh, and find 13 episodes that were going to be that were going to have this common thread but be uniquely different to be interesting mm -hmm. 
Well, I think one of the one of the big revelations I had from living in the states for so many years was that um, when we talk about North America and the North American model of of um, of nature conservation and how uh, hunting and fishing is an integrated part into the whole financial system that supports um, the outdoor agencies, the net, the the um, for now anyway, unless they yeah, repeal now, yeah. the act, yeah. True. True, true. Let's see. Yeah, I don't know what that tart is thinking about. But um, it, it was clear that the North Americans don't really understand the depth of um, the European hunting cultures and how it differs a lot. So I thought it could be very interesting for me to bring a series to North America. And we are, we are airing both on um, right now on Wild TV and then in a few weeks on the Pursuit Channel in the States. Um, so I thought it would be very interesting for me to kind of introduce North America to some more in-depth stories surrounding hunting. Um, as, a, as the project, the Urban Huntsman Project has been from the beginning, it, it, it's kind of one part uh, culture, travel, and then one part food and one part hunting, fishing, outdoors. And I wanted to implement that into the series and have all these, um, all these three categories have more or less equal weight. Now, that, that um, ended up being a lot more challenging than I was hoping for, but we can get back to that. Um, but the concept itself was to introduce North, Amer North America to a younger generations of hunters that um, actually, true to the concept itself, many of them have either a professional career or have one foot in an urban, urban city environment and then um, putting, uh, putting a lot of money and time and resources into uh, uh, re-establishing that nature connection. Um, so I wanted these, I wanted the, the picture of European hunters to be a younger one, a fresher one. Uh, I wanted them to see what the next generation of hunters actually looks like um, and see if there was some inspiration there because as, as much as the North American model is uh, great and works. There's, there is certainly rooms, uh, room for improvement, and I think there's some inspiration that can come from some of the ways that we handle and talk about hunting and then we um, show a certain level of historic respect for animals, for example, and not that it has to be adapted into a North American version, but I think if we start talking about social media and uh, the incredible challenge we have ahead of us hunting in general all over the planet, um, we have a lot of opposition and a lot of these people that are opposed to hunting are very well educated. They are digitally versed, so they are on Twitter, they are on Instagram, and they know how to communicate more than anything else. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why we're losing the battle, and that's why we, in certain areas of, of Europe, uh, could potentially face a, a hunting shutdown uh, if nothing dramatically changes within uh, a few years from now. So I think that maybe the North American model uh, can take some inspiration and maybe take some points out of both the positive and also the negative of what's going on in parts of the European Union and some of these countries now that are uh, facing some incredible challenges for, for hunting. Um, so that's what we, we set out to do, to have a fresh voice to show that there's, it's a very broad um, group of Hunters is not a stereotypical hunter uh, that is a, a blue collar worker that goes out and shoots everything. And, you know, I wanted to take away that stigma also to the 
um, non-hunting population and show people that are able to articulate themselves and and put words to the experience that uh, maybe these non-hunters are not used to hearing and something that, you know, speak in a tone that will resonate with our basic human needs and, and something that we therefore can, if we not accept it, at least can understand it and uh, respect hunters' decision or decisions to go out and harvest some of the meat themselves and understand what the alternative might look like if mm. we don't. Fascinating. So where did you, what countries did you, did you touch? Did you go to? So we, uh, we were in Romania. We went to Transylvania, Romania. And that was, um, that was basically an episode for us to time travel. It was a time travel. I wanted to go back to some of these areas that are considered and, and called Europe's last wilderness, where people live in remote towns and live in a way that uh, that they did a hundred years ago. Yeah, self self sufficient with a little garden and little, uh, basically a little small holding with their own uh, chickens, with a pig and a cow and. Um, basically, essentially, are self sufficient and have a, a, a richer beyond belief in time, which is our the only currency that we can't fucking go out and buy more. Of. <laughs> this is very so, true. Well, I think there was something you know there was something essential in that episode that I really wanted to go back and and maybe look at the lives of these people through a different lens and say. How can we actually learn something from that? I want people in general to learn something from these episodes, to have something to take away. Not, uh, it, it's not the episodes is not about the kill or the whatever we we harvest. Uh, there's a there's an essential story in each one of these these episodes, and this one here was kind of like a Back to the Future episode, where I, I wanted to go back and see what we can learn, what I can learn from the way that these people are living and and understand how i could take some of that and implement that into my own life and better my own life better the environment better the animal welfare around me uh, uh in the production chain etc so that was a very cool episode and that was the first one and then we went to hungary afterwards um so were you in hungary working when i saw you in hungary last year yep yeah yeah last year yep exactly we just filmed the first one at that time. Um, and what what was your focus in Hungary? Uh, Hungary, we visited a because um, they have amazing hunting culture there. Yeah, they do. They do. Uh, it's it's kind of an interesting story because as much as I wanted to dive into Hungary's hunting story and history, um, the story here is actually a different one. It's less about history and more about the future again um we visited a biodynamic winery okay and the and the person that runs that is uh, is i call him the bavarian wolf because <laughs> uh he is uh, an incredible guy that's very determined and his name is florian and um and we since been the, become really good friends. I, I first visited him actually with Tyler from from Modern oh, Huntsman. Oh, okay. So there's a so that's the same winery that's in in that volume of Modern Huntsman, the story. Yeah, yeah exactly. Ah, okay, so full circle. Uh, yeah, yeah, full circle. And I really thought that um, that he deserved an entire episode himself, and I wanted to go back there to dive deeper into his story and his philosophy. Um, of course, with the foundation of hunting and, and some food. Um, but he runs this winery as a biodynamic winery today. And uh, traditionally, it sits right on the, on the uh, Balaton Lake, which is incredibly beautiful. I think you visited it when you were in Hungary, didn't you? Yep, yep. yep. Uh, incredibly beautiful area. But um, we know about 20 years ago, or maybe even further back, 30 years ago, um, uh, there was an uh, enormous algae bloom in the lake because of 
uh, rainwater wash off from all the agricultural fields around with all the fertile and artificial fertilizer going into the lake. And, and basically it ended up killing all life in the lake itself. And all the tourists disappeared because the lake was uh, essentially toxic. Um, but what Florian did is not that he himself single-handedly uh, went in and saved the Balaton Lake, but he went and took a an, uh, conventional uh, wine estate and turned it into biodynamic uh, wine estate, eliminated all pesticides, all herbicides, and all artificial fertilizer. And everybody there was shaking their head and thinking that this guy is uh, completely madly insane and uh, this is never going to be profitable. But today, several years after, he has now developed like a biodiversity heaven in uh, all these lands that he took over and turned into to, uh, biodynamic uh, agriculture practices. Uh, so I think it's a model for change. It's, uh, again, uh, kind of taking a step back and saying, what we actually did 100 years ago was not that fucking stupid. Uh, and, and you can actually go in and turn a profit on it. I think that's such an step. If you, I went to business school, and it all goes back to the money. So we have, I think, we have to show that in these stories. We have to understand, well, how can this actually function? How can it be profitable? How can it be practical? How, how can we implement these changes? And he was a great example because now the winery is doing great. His wines are winning prices left and right. And, you know, he built an eco hotel and an eco restaurant that's all more or less self-sustainable from the garden that they build out. They now have cows and chickens and, you know, so there's models that actually work. Um, and so it's a little bit of the same theme of looking back and saying, how can we, how can we take all that knowledge that we have today? How can we take all our statistic, uh, statistics and all our, our ingenuity and, and go in and develop something based on a principle that's an old principle where everything is in balance, that we take a look at nature and saying, how can we interfere the minimal possible and actually make this works, uh, make it work. So that was the, that was the Hungary episode. And we went out Hunting for roe deer in between the um, the rows of of uh, wines. Uh, the pictures up. from from the story that you did, I guess, almost two years ago, or maybe yeah. more actually, were ago. were amazing to see the you know hunting in a winery in a vineyard. Oh, it's incredible, and you know, with uh, I typically a lot of people are are focusing on on what they hunt. They are deer hunter, or they are hunt ducks, or they hunt hares, or um, I'm an opportunistic hunter. I go out and then I shoot whatever I get a chance for, whatever I can consume and eat after. And that's what we did there. They have a, a really big population of, of um, red deer and uh, roe deer and wild boar. So we just went out and we ended up, you know, it's, it's uh, because of this biodiversity and the, the amount of food that there is in, in this area now. Um, uh, the road years are like everywhere, and so uh, true enough, we didn't we didn't walk for long before we had we had road years crossing left and right, and then we we found one that was that was uh, in need, and we uh, met that need for it. So more uh, about that. So <laughs> tremendous. And did you oh. Did you ever make it over, I can't remember, when you were sort of halfway through filming, I remember having a conversation with you about coming and filming in the UK. Did you ever make it to the UK or did that no, not we feature? No, we didn't. Um, at the time, this was Smackdown in the middle of COVID. That's right. And we had, was, you know, from, from day one, we had so many challenges because uh, part of the initial crew uh, got struck with COVID and had to pull out. Shortly before we started, a couple of weeks before we actually started filming, um, then we had closure of countries. One country closed down. Hungary closed down. 
then we couldn't drive through in, in order to drive from, from Italy and get to Romania. You have to go through Hungary. If you don't, it's a uh, tremendous detour. Uh, so we had a challenge going through Hungary, so we had to reschedule. And throughout the whole entire production time, um, which lasted uh, six, almost seven months, and it should have been just four months, um, uh, we had just closures left and right. We had crew members becoming sick again. We had guests um, calling in with a COVID diagnosis at 7 o'clock in the morning when we're meeting at 7.30. Oh, um, goodness. It's, so it was, I don't know how much production you did during that that time period. Quite a but, lot, <laughs> but, yeah. but most of it was in Africa. <laughs> well, okay, okay. I, I could have, I could assume one way or the other. Either if there is a challenge, uh, you can, you can probably pay your way out of it. There, That's exactly but, uh, what you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly do. <laughs> I know. I thought I could do that in Italy, but the, I was like, all these movies that I've seen, uh, they're all bullshit. <laughs> nobody, nobody's taking, nobody's taking uh, money under the table there. Or nobody's doing anybody a favor. No little envelopes being passed back and forth. So, All by the book. Big disappointment. Anyway, um, it, it was a big challenge from from day one. So, uh, yeah, the the production time ended up being a lot longer. Obviously, financially, they, it ended up costing a lot more than expected. Um, so it was a big challenge, but but we did it with uh, with some. Crew changes in between several times. Uh, we ended up having uh, produced thirteen episodes where we where we also we went to to Italy several episodes. Uh, went uh, went hunting in the Venetian lagoon. Um, I'm a big Hemingway fan, and he's a big inspiration for my writing. And uh, I wanted to backtrack him a little bit in in Italy, so we went to to venice and we had uh, we had some bellinis and we went duck hunting in the lagoon and we went to uh, uh the decoy maker that actually made hemingway's uh well, decoys oh incredible uh, hand carved decoys so but is he still alive no unfortunately just the, just the maker the father, just, okay the father just passed away um a year and a half ago now so we just we just missed him um, unfortunately but the the son was there and and he was a um, he was a part he went hunting with Hemingway and his father out in the in the lagoon so we got a lot of good stories and looked at pictures and then we went out and actually went went hunting um, in the lagoon so quite quite incredible. Um, then a, a few other episodes in in Italy we went to a, a place called Castello Vicarello down in Tuscany and went hunting there which was a uh, very different episode, and I'm uh, interested to see how that actually is going to be received. Um, I can and give something away, a little bit away, that it was actually hunting in an enclosed area, which is the first time I ever done that, and I was very much. Um, it didn't sit well with me. Uh, it never has. And it was kind of a, a, a little bit of a, a challenge for me um, philosophically to actually do that. But in the name of journalism, I uh, decided to follow along. And of course, visiting that incredible Castello and staying there for a couple of days also was a big draw. But um, I wanted to understand why it's done and how it's done and understand the dynamics of it and and see um, see what I would think and feel about it when I actually experienced it myself. It, um, it's so important to do that though, Danny, because I, I was having a conversation about a controversial topic the other day and uh, with just somebody locally and we were talking about it and I was saying that for me, I want to understand it from every point of view. You know, I want to be, I want to be in that environment that is so controversial. You know, w you know, whatever th that, whatever that might be. You know, whether that's, you know, if you're from the outside, and you go and spend some time with a trophy hunter. If it's um, international whaling, uh, you go and go on the boat and actually see what it's like. Because so very often judgments are made with no knowledge whatsoever other than what you've read and what you think you know sure and that's tainted always yeah 
Yeah. yeah, so it takes a lot to, to say to yourself, I'm going to go into this. I understand what my biases are. <clears throat> I've acknowledged yeah. my biases. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go into this with the most open mind that I can because I want to learn. I want to understand this point of view. So okay. that's awesome that you did that. Yeah, it, it, was, a, it was a great experience. And my, my good friend, uh, Matt from New York, who has uh, the William Brown Project, the uh, men's uh, lifestyle magazine, came and joined me. and. Uh, we did this together and it all ties back to food. Um, every single episode always ties back to food is a foundation for all 13 episodes. And this one specifically is, it's, um, it's, it's very reliant, the story itself and the understanding of the concept and, and the story here and the concept of, of actually hunting that way. Uh, if you want to call it hunting, and which it is, in my opinion, it is hunting after experience it. Uh, it certainly is hunting, but you could, you could, and I do um, uh, compare it to going to a grocery store in another way. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of there's a lot of contemplation about that uh, in the episode itself, and uh, and I think it's healthy for people to see. It's also healthy for hunters to see. Uh, because we can pretend like these uh, kinds of hunts and this way of hunting is doesn't exist, but it does. And we need to understand exactly what right to existence it has, if any at all. That's up to the individual hunter to maybe make that distinction. But uh, it's a part of the id of hunting in general so we need to understand that we need to be able to communicate about it and that's that's what i went in there to to do to explore and understand how i could talk to somebody that is questioning that way of hunting and say well it, the animals don't have a chance because they're they're in a cage well, they're not in a cage they're in a in a high fence that is about 500 hectares um granted they're not free they're uh, free with uh, some limitations but um you know we need to understand what it is and i think i think the episode did a a, a good job of actually showing this i was a bit surprised of the pushback um that i got from some uh how should i say that established uh sources uh information sources that were saying that no 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 you can't talk about it you should not you you should not show the fence or you cannot talk about the fence i'm like that's the whole story the story is the fence it's a fence uh, it's a story about a fence <laughs> so all the all the rest of it is context but the story is about the fence so um that was kind of surprising to me yeah that's it's i was speaking to somebody about fences and management in mm -hmm. texas actually uh, a couple of weeks ago and they had eventually decided to put up a fence around the property and i can't remember how big it was a few thousand acres yeah. um and it wasn't so much in this instance it wasn't so much to keep stuff in but to keep stuff out so that they could actually manage it yeah. and we often yeah. think about fences keeping stuff in but it is sometimes about keeping things out. And yeah. their issue there was controlling deer populations because uh, it was just was physically impossible with, with the I'm terrain sure and manpower. Place. Yeah, to, to control and try and reinstate some sort of dynamic equilibrium of habitat management uh -huh. with this influx of, of whitetail you know, coming in. And that was the purpose of oh. their fence. So they hunt in that really and essentially... Is the hogs is the is the wild boar the hogs that fail pigs true that, yeah that, that is too. typically I know that there's a lot of places that actually puts up fence because uh, both of agriculture is uh, just being destroyed and decimated by all these hogs and and also because of the the biodiversity there is it, just crumbling because they destroy and eat everything so mm. I, I've seen that for myself so I I know the impact the the reality is that. Uh land management and the existence of humans within ecosystems is not tidy uh, it's quite no. messy and it's very complicated yeah and it's not and there is no one size fits all yeah. and you're right 
like all of the all of the all of the different land uses that exist we need to understand and we need to talk about them and then we need to try and work out if they can be done better or whether mm -hmm. that's a system that needs to evolve with time uh but yeah, to just be eradicated i think uh we need to we need to understand that uh, we need to be open to saying that you know what with a <laughs> We might have done some different things in a certain way for 200 years, but that does not mean necessarily that it should continue. And I think that's also something that we need to be open about and not categorically just say, well, we have done that. It's a right. I don't, I don't think that. I think we, I think we need to take a broad evaluation of the impact that we have as humans, and that includes how hunters impact their environment around it and how they both on a positive and a negative level, potentially negative level. Um, and I think that's, um, for me, I would like people to take away from, from these 13 episodes a, a, an openness to look at things uh, from all angles and being open to reevaluate uh, situations when new information comes in that requires a a an evaluation of the practices of the past. Yep. Um, so I hope I hope people can take that away from the series. Is there something in your series that really stands out? There was something that blew uh, a particular experience that just blew your mind. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I Can think, you share uh, that? I've had a lot of hunting experiences, but um, I didn't get to Denmark before, but we did go to Denmark uh, for four episodes in total. And I'm actually in Denmark right now, and I'm, I'm uh, regaining new perspectives on it uh, while being here. Um, out of the countries that I visited through hunting and through traveling i think denmark and scandinavia in general i should say but denmark i know best um have a different understanding and different way of talking and communicating about hunting there is an extremely high approval rate in denmark of hunting higher than anywhere else and it's because we there are some organizations that have done a really good job at telling the entire story telling a 360 degree story surrounding hunting, the hunting lifestyle. Um, so we went to Denmark and visited a program that's called Become Nature Wise. And it's a program that's developed between three uh, um, NGOs, the Danish Hunting Union, the Danish Sports Fishing Union, and the Danish National, uh, Nature Conservancy. And these three unions with financial support from a foundation that's from the Danish, uh, at, at the, the, the largest uh, Danish bank, and now with government support have developed this program to educate kids about nature, about ecology, about sustainability, about our role in the ecosystem and the environment. Uh, and that includes hunting. So we went and visited this program with, uh, with the, the director that kind of was the idea man behind the project itself. And with one of the, I think it's 170 plus volunteers all over Denmark that goes out to different institutions, including public schools and teaches hunting and tell them about what hunting is, brings in a dead uh, roe deer or pheasant and have them help clean it, uh, bring a rifle into a classroom and tell them how a rifle works and how a suppressor works and how you lay down and to get the best shot and brings in uh, a hide from a, from a roe deer with bullet holes and puts, a, you know, put a pencil through the bullet hole so you can see where it actually hit and understand what vitals it hits inside and paired up with mathematics, with uh, population curves and all of that. It's an, an incredible program and it's so successful. Like they have requests from so many institutions and, and school classes 
that uh, they don't have enough people to um, to actually go out and 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 share this information and get them these uh, this uh, informational material. It's uh, as they call it. They don't. They're uh, they're very uh, cautious about calling it education material because that is what is coming from the institutions, uh, you know, the official government institutions. So it's information material instead, which is, again, a sensitivity to the um, the selection of words that we use to describe hunting. Uh, a killing uh, could and maybe should be considered a harvest instead to draw in the right context when we talk about it in the public space. Uh, so they have done a tremendous job of developing this program and developing this way of communicating. Uh, so we went there and, and spent one day with the third grader class. Where oh, so they you filmed got, this? Yeah, yeah, we filmed oh, the amazing. Whole episode. Um, so the first day was education in the uh, information. Shit, I just dropped it. <laughs> so it's information in the classroom and practical games that are uh, showing uh, one how population uh, population curves actually works in the wild, uh, which is brilliant because now it's a game and now they understand all the numbers and graphs that they just, you know, they saw the hour yeah, they're, before. They're applying it in real life. Yeah. They, they are living it. They're living that uh, material. They're living that information and they're retaining it. Um, so it's incredible. And then they had some uh, some games where they had to learn to tiptoe up to one person that was by one of the classmates that was blindfolded, uh, uh, imitating a predator prey situation in the wild. And it was a tremendous so day two. We go hunting with the entire class of, uh, I don't know how many students there were, 20 students maybe, three teachers, three cameramen. Uh, <laughs> we tried to go hunting, so that was interesting. And and we ended up harvesting a, a roe deer um, with this class where nobody has been out hunting, not one, not the two teachers, not any of the, not any of the, the, um, the pupils, any of the students there have ever been out hunting before. And mm-hmm. what we found... And what we saw was something that was stripped of influence from outside institutions, from parents, from media, from schools, etc. It was essentially um, the the layers of the uh, the onion of these kids was just peeled back, and it was just the essentials. It was just uh, intuition and and their the basic skills that stepped in and we saw these these kids acting like this was the most natural thing in the world which is so interesting because we know even though it wasn't their even though it wasn't their world it was not their world it was the first time they ever experienced it they were uh they got fever you know they got the they got the buck fever uh, and they were they were shaking because it was just the, their their primal being was just at the forefront here and all their senses were just activated and the first thing that they did they could not wait to get out to the the road here and you just see these kids as soon as they got the okay first we did a you know, we do the tradition that many countries here in Europe do, that they feed the uh, the last meal for um, whatever game that's harvested, in this case, the roe deer. So we explain to the kids why we do this. It, it's a kind of a, a homage to the to the animal. It's just showing respect, and we, we pluck uh, uh, some grass or... We give them a leaf in their mouth uh, for some food for the last uh, for the last journey, and we explain why we do that. It's obviously something that's uh, metaphorical and uh, and and it's something that's rooted in tradition, but it's something beautiful. And I think that side of hunting and the side that um, that respect for the animal that we show in the majority of that we focus a lot on in the majority of these episodes will give non-hunters a deeper understanding 
off the respect that we actually have for the animals. And I think yeah. that's so essential that we actually show that and we articulate it, that we put words to it. Um, these kids, the first thing that they did when they got the OK after that was just dive down and touch the animal and move its uh, its head around, check its teeth, touch the blood. Like it was the most natural thing that they could possibly do. And like they have done nothing else in their entire life. So it's so interesting when we actually stri- strip away these uh, these influences that people have and then say, well, how would you react in a situation like that That's if you have not been primed by the institutions around you? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's there's such a, um, an inherent inbuilt ability for us to process that kind of information that we just don't realize. It's like, how does a little duckling know how to swim? Yeah, yeah. Well, because uh, it, of course it has to, because that is how it's evolved. It has yeah. evolved to be able to hatch and immediately be able to swim with his little feet and follow his mom around. Yeah. We, if you turn the clock back, the the scenario that you've just explained would have been very normal. And there are still it's cultures it's around the world where that exists, actually. Yeah. Essential for survival. Yeah. I, I, I understand that I, um, I obviously have a broader... Um, point of view on consumption, food consumption today and food production today. Uh, But I don't shy away from the fact that that is something that is inherently uh, human. And it's something that I think will have a place in the future. I understand that uh, we can't all go out and hunt and we need to understand how we produce food in the future in a sustainable way, in a humane way. Uh, We need to understand what alternatives we might have uh, or that we need to develop, not that we might have, but that we need to develop uh, for the future for us to sustain ourselves on this planet with seven plus million people. But um, the conversation needs to go back and, and we need to understand that this is something that is one part of that solution. Absolutely. Well, Danny, it sounds like a, a fascinating series, and I, uh, I haven't, I haven't seen an episode yet, and I, I can't wait to watch the first episode and get through thirteen of them. And I'm I, I, just from what you've described, I hope that it's, I hope that it's well received and received by a broad spectrum of people, because I guess that's that's the aim here. It is the aim. I mean, I, I really hope that this. Um... I've, we, we are talking to a distribution company and um, I, there seems to be some interest from some uh, general TV stations. And I hope that we can take this, maybe not season one, because one of the things that you, you have to kind of keep in mind is who you're talking to and you have to be sure that you're, that you're gaining their uh, interest also. So I think for me in, um, in season one, the uh, the episodes are a little heavier focused on the hunting part than I would do for the future. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of food and there's a lot of hunting and all of them. But the culture side of it uh, is a little bit suppressed, unfortunately. But um, I think it will have an appeal to the broader audience. And I hope that in the if not season one, then from season two that we will be on on different TV stations, also on general TV stations, and and be out broadcasting to a, a much broader uh, broader audience that is not necessarily hunters and outdoorsmen. So, if people want to watch it now, where can they find it? Go to Wild TV, wildtv.com, and you can go on the Instagram too. It's Wild underscore TV, and there's a link to downloading the app there. Um, and you can uh, you can go in and stream each episode directly from there, and you can also watch live TV uh, directly from there uh, from the app. Um, it is a subscription model, but it's uh, it's quite inexpensive. I think it's five ninety nine per month. So uh, there's a lot of good content on there. Um, most importantly, my content that the Urban Huntsman program is on there. So, of course, uh, 
this would be this would be incentive enough. Other than that, go on to um, theurbanhuntsman.com and look at everything there. There's previews for each one. There's also a link over to our YouTube channel. Um, that will start featuring a lot more content. And there's a preview for each one of the episodes, oh, awesome. about a five-minute preview. For oh, wow. Okay. That's great. On there. Um, and there will be a lot of uh, additional content, both on the website and also on YouTube, uh, video, recipes, behind-the-scenes stuff, and all that kind of fun stuff. And did you have any... Sponsorship support to help you pull you to uh, pull, pull I did, this whole thing I did. off. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I almost forgot it. We we ended up getting to Blazer Blazer Group in as a sponsor. Oh, incredible! And really taking off my my hat to them for for jumping on the project and believing in it. And obviously, somebody like them, uh, they have um, they have very much the same vision as I do and as you do and as a lot of our. Uh, peers that we normally uh, uh, roll with uh, do, and it, it's uh, it's one of a, a future of hunting and, uh, and and looking forward. And I think Blazer, uh, I know Blazer realized that this is very much aligned with their philosophy, and and the only way forward if if hunting is to remain a, an option, a lifestyle option uh in the future specifically in in europe now where it's, it's it's severely threatened in in some countries and essentially in in the entire eu that's um that's centrally controlled except for the united kingdom right <laughs> now well, i guess there's one good thing about brexit <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know i think we're, we're dealing with our own we're dealing with our own problems when it comes to oh, the think? world of hunting <laughs> oh for, for <laughs> yeah, yeah oh the sarcasm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, that's great that you got support there. That's fantastic. Yeah, but it's really a, um, um, I can't thank them enough, and um, and they are also coming in and and being uh, uh, open for support for the future season. So, um, very happy about that. I think there's other other institutions and companies in within hunting that needs to step up and actually put the. Um, their money where their mouth is and their money where their business is and yep. understand that it's severely threatened uh, and they need to step up and actually actively engage. I think one of the biggest challenges for the production itself, and that was something when you and I met the last time that I brought up on the symposium that we, you and I were both a part of, is funding, centralized funding for telling the story of hunting the right story of hunting. Yep. Um, and I think there's a, there's a lot of really, really good storytellers out there. But, uh, you know, we spend the majority of our time chasing money, trying to figure out how we can actually do this, how we can pawn off our house or my our loved ones or whatever it is <laughs> yeah. to find funding to, to come in and, and actually try and see if we can do our part in in securing the lifestyle, the hunting lifestyle for the future. And I think that uh, it's really, there is some focus on it now. I'm glad to see that. And I hope that we find a model where there can be some centralized funding coming in through hunting licenses uh, throughout Europe and maybe throughout North America that will go into a pool that then for story will time. be administered yeah. and, and tell the hunting story because that's what the anti-hunting organization do. Yeah, They're, you know, they're having tremendous amount of money coming in. I know that in Europe we, we are 27 to 1 outgunned financially. The anti-hunting organizations statistic. are... So, so you know, we are we are outgunned financially, and also we are outgunned outgunned on the the media side because we we don't uh, hunters traditionally don't have an ability to really speak about this and and articulate themselves and put words to what it means what it means to them to be a hunter and what it is. So, hopefully, I can help with this series too to uh, dress hunters up to th speak about this in a different way and not being afraid of of tying some emotions to the experience itself which i think if we leave out the emotional connection that we have as hunters to the environment to nature to the animals that we hunt to the food that we eat 
if we exclude that, uh, what will be left to the rest of the population, to the anti-hunters, is nothing but the kill. Yeah, And that's a death sentence for us. Well, Danny, that is a, a brilliant way to bring this show to a close. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> and thank you so much for sharing some insights into your series. And everybody just needs to get over and see it. And uh, feel free to fire the feedback either to Danny or to me through the podcast. I'll make sure that he that he gets the feedback. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in person again at some point. Or are you seeing one of my colleagues very soon? Chris Dombrowski is coming over to... Yes, to yes, yes. I'm very, very much looking forward to having a couple of days with him. Let's yeah. see what we can come up with. Great, Danny. Well, thanks very much for your time. And, um, okay, I'll thank you, you Byron. Good to talk to you. Cheers, mate.